Hare Krishna. So today morning, discussing from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the remarkable pastime where Krishna, where the Krishna in the form of Varaha is rescuing the earth from the atrocities of Hiranyaksh. So today and tomorrow, I will speak on the theme of how the Lord keeps uh, us afloat in material existence. We are also sinking, drowning in this ocean. So here, Prabhupada in the purport writes that how has Vara, the, o the earth which has sunk into the ocean, is lifted up by Varaha and he keeps it. But it doesn't sink again. It stays afloat. Now how does it stay afloat? The Bhagavatam says that it is because the Lord invested his power in it. Vinyasya tasyam adadad swasattvam swasattvam his own existence from that he gave potency by which it started staying afloat. And Prabhupada says how can this happen? This may seem impossible. So I'll talk today three main points on this how the laws that act in the world require an explanation. The second point will be that how the Lord explains both the laws and the transcendence to the laws. And the third point will be how that applies to us in the balance of justice and mercy. So firstly, <clears throat> when something is floating, like the planets are floating, the scientific explanation is that uh, there are the laws of nature, the, the laws of physics, the law of gravity specifically. So the laws are used to explain the behavior of natural phenomena. And yes, they are an explanation to some extent. But the laws themselves require an explanation. What does it mean? That laws, why should the laws exist at all? It is that laws don't themselves anywhere exist. If you consider there's a law okay, in different parts of the world, either you drive on the left or drive on the right. Now this law does not exist on its own. So atheistic scientists, they try to say that laws are intrinsic to matter. That what, what they say is that you just give us one assumption and with that assumption we will explain everything. But what is that assumption? That assumption is that matter along with the laws of nature exists forever. Now, why should it exist forever like that? And anyway, even science now says the universe is not eternal. So when Newton, I had just been to London where he saw the same tree where Newton saw the apple falling. Some people say the apple fell in front of him, some people say it fell on him. Whichever way, uh, that tree is now preserved. It's like a pilgrimage place for scientists. <laughs> they go and cherish, oh, how brilliant was Newton, he got that inspiration over there. Now certainly at one level it's his brilliance. But Newton, when he was himself asked, many scientists at that time criticized the law of gravitation. And they said, this is just spooky. Uh, the, the planet, the moon is somewhere far away, the earth is far away. How does this force radiate through space? How does it act? And Newton said, I am not going to talk about the origin. I don't know. He said that the mechanism I do not know. I am only giving a mathematical equation for an observed phenomena. That objects fall on the ground. How do they fall? With what force? He got some idea and he proposed that. Now at one level, Newton also believed in God. And he said that, Oh Father, I think thy thoughts after thee. That means he saw his scientific discoveries 
as spiritual insights into the way God had fashioned the universe. It's, that means the laws are there, but how do the laws come? God has arranged it. So, oh Father, I think thy thoughts after thee. A famous Indian mathematician Srinivas Ramanujan, he said that an equation for me has no meaning unless it represents a thought of God. An equation E is equal to mc square. Why should it be equal? That's because it's a thought of God. So there are many scientists who recognize that the laws of nature don't explain themselves. Their existence requires some other explanation. Now broadly, science has three alternate alternatives. First is that the laws exist as they are. The second is that now the laws are so specific that they can't have you come by chance. So they say maybe there are multiple universes and in each universe there are different laws and in our universe the laws happen to be like this and the third explanation is the laws come from some intelligent design from some higher organizing principle one of the biggest greatest scientists of the last century Einstein preferred the third explanation the first explanation if you consider the laws just exist there's no explanation why they should just exist. Matter is insentient. How does matter organize itself according to precise laws? Then the other explanation is that there are many, many universes and there are laws in all these universes. Different laws. And it's like you throw a dice. If you throw six dices, then one will fall six. So like that, there are millions of universes and in one of us, the law, one of them, the laws have come out right. But although this theory is proposed by scientists, the theory is itself not very scientific because these parallel universes have no evidence at all. And in fact, by definition itself, you cannot observe them. So it's, it's more of a speculation to avoid the third conclusion. The third conclusion is there is some intelligent, intelligent organizing principle behind the laws. So this understanding is very important. God is not the explanation for the unexplainable. God is not the explanation for the unexplainable. The typical atheistic narrative is that, oh, in the past, people did not know how rains would happen. That's why they thought there must be some God of rain. People didn't know how uh, the plants grew. That's why. They thought there must be some goddess or uh, uh, deity of the forest. In this way, because of ignorance, people imagined some gods. But now, science knows the explanations. Therefore, there is no need for God. See, one vision of looking at it is that God is the explanation for the unexplainable. That what we can't explain, we attribute to God. But the way we are discussing over here is, not that God is the explanation for the unexplainable, but rather God is the explanation for explainability. For God is the explanation for explainability. That means why is anything explainable? You might say, okay, the planets are flowing because of gravity. The plants grow because of photosynthesis. Okay, that's fine. But where did this me mechanism come from? So God is not, not like a magic wand, an explanation for everything. No, whatever explanation we come up with, what is the basis for that explanation? Why should nature obey laws? So God is the explanation for explainability. And if you understand these two different approaches, that means what is it? So science is gaining some knowledge. And some people think that there is a con conflict between science and religion. As scientific knowledge increases, religion will decrease. Because as science explains more and more things, then there is no need for God. But that is not the vision we are talking about here. That it is whatever science is able to explain, why is science able to explain that? On what basis? So what, what it means is, let's consider the example of gravity itself. So what is gravity? Oh, it is a force that keeps planets afloat. Okay. What keeps planets afloat? That's gravity. 
where is the explanation here? Gravity is simply a name we have given to an observed phenomena. So naming an observed phenomena is not explaining that phenomena. Now naming could be a part of the explanation. Just like say, if somebody is, if, you, if a child is walking normally and suddenly the child falls down, okay, why is the child not able to walk? That's what, maybe 20, 40, 45 years ago, when I was just one, I was walking one day, my parents told me this, and I just fell down. And then, I just couldn't walk. They rushed me to the doctor, and they found that I had got polio. So now, polio is a name given to the disease. That, okay, the leg is no longer functioning because you have polio. But that doesn't explain where polio came from. You need to know what happened, where did the germs come from? So in my case, what had happened was that the doctor had given some vaccine and to prevent the polio, but the vaccine was defective. And the vaccine, instead of preventing the polio, gave me the polio. So the point is that there is naming a phenomena and explaining a phenomena. So the inability to walk is caused by polio. That's an explanation. But that's only one level of explanation. A set of symptoms, you can give them the name polio. But that doesn't explain, and it's not clear. It's not clear? Okay. Yeah, I also felt that. Is it better now? Hare Krishna. Is it better? Yeah, I think. So, were you able to understand what I spoke till now or should I repeat it? <laughs> okay. So, I was basically saying that naming a phenomena doesn't explain the phenomena. We need some further explanation. Okay, this polio, but where did polio come from? So, like that we may say, what keeps a planet afloat is gravity. But where did gravity come from? So the point is that we don't position science and God as in competition. If science explains something, God becomes redundant. No. If science explains something, how does science get the ability to explain that? Why is nature explanation explainable at all? So God is not the explanation for the unexplainable. He is the explanation for explainability. Why is anything explainable at all? Why are there laws in nature? Where do those laws come from? If we understand this, then we don't envision this conflict. In fact, the more science advances, the more we see God's glory in the advancement of science. <coughs> That's why it was Pascal who said that a little of science takes man away from God, but immersion in science brings them back to God. So little science, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this, why don't you need God? If you go deep into science, why, why are things the way they are? Why is science able to explain things? We come back to God. So that is the first and second point I can say. The laws of nature require an explanation and God is the explanation for that. Now how exactly is God the explanation? That the world is organized by divine will. When people use the word God, they may have some religious connotation or this image in the temple or this particular figure in history or whatever. Let's not start with that figure. Let's start with the con concept. The concept is that there is an organizing principle. Now what is the nature of that organizing principle? So is that just like a presence or is that personal? So there are two visions of the universe. One is that it is mechanical and the second is it is personal. Now the mechanical and the personal visions can both work together also. Just like say if you go to somebody's house for a program and they have got some item which is delicious over there. Now you may want to know two things. Who made this? And how did they make it? So now the recipe and the cook are not 
two contradictory explanations. They are complementary explanations. The recipe describes the mechanism by which it is made. And the cook is the personal agent who made it. So what science discovers is the recipe. Okay, how do, how do things operate in the universe? That is the mechanical explanation. So the recipe is the mechanical explanation. The cook is the personal explanation. And both the mechanical and the personal explanation can work together. Now just because we have a recipe doesn't mean that there is no need for a cook. And just because there is a cook doesn't mean there is no need for a recipe. So God, God exists. So God is like the cook for material nature. And the law of gravity is the recipe. So why do things operate the way they are? The laws are the mechanical explanation. And that's also valid. We don't deny that the mechanical explanation is valid. But, the, but God is the personal explanation. And now this brings us to an important point. That if we see only the mechanical explanation and make it absolute. Say if somebody wants to make a desert, we want to make halwa. And we have got a particular particular recipe by which the halwa is made. And then the halwa tastes very good. But suppose today some of those ingredients are not available. If somebody were working simply on mechanical principles, they would say, oh, we can't cook that today. But somebody who is an expert cook, they say, okay, what ingredients do you have? Maybe with the other ingredients, we can still cook something which may taste just as good. It may not be identical, but you want a delicious desert? We can have a delicious desert, but with some ingredients. So the mechanical view restricts us to the mechanical process alone. Whereas the personal view focuses on the purpose. And the process is subordinate to the purpose. The process is important. But if, the, if somehow that process is not possible, then the purpose can be served in some other way. So that is the expertise of the cook. So, the, so if sometimes without using the recipe, a cook makes a delicious dessert, a delicious halwa. Now, if somebody says, you are actually tasting the halwa, say, no, this halwa is not possible. Why? The recipe was not followed. Well, the pr pr product is there. No, no, it's not possible. It's already done. No, not possible. So, now, for example, here, the earth is floating on the ocean. Now, how can the earth float on the ocean? That's not possible. But the earth is floating. How? It's not possible. So, yes, you could say the normal laws of gravity won't allow it to float. But gravity is like the recipe. The product is flotation. So, now the Lord can, can get things to float. He may use a standard particular mechanism for making the planets float. But that doesn't mean he is stuck with that mechanism. If he wants, he can get that same purpose served without using that process. So normally objects don't float on the water unless say they are constructed of a particular material, constructed in a particular shape and that's how they may float. But, the, but that floating also needs an explanation. That explanation is that God has arranged that mechanism and just as a cook can bypass the recipe and still make a good item. Similarly, the Lord can bypass the process and still provide the result. That's why miracles are not against science. Miracles are above science. We don't reject science. We don't say, oh, science is all wrong. Miracles are above science. They are an explanation which is above the mechanical level of explanation. The mechanical is real. We don't deny the reality. And science, scientists work very hard to 
understand the mechanisms by which nature works and that's also their hard work their intelligence can be appreciated but where they go wrong is when they make the mechanical explanation the complete explanation and they say there is no explanation except the mechanical explanation that is where they go wrong and this principle applies in our lives also how i talk at the third point now i talk about is that we can talk about the laws of physics you know, science uses the word laws of nature and shila prabhupad uses the word laws of nature and they use it in quite different senses when prabhupad uses the word laws of nature for example prabhupad has a book called the laws of nature that book he is talking about the which law is he talking about gravity what is he talking about karma yes thank you so he's talking about the laws of karma over there the science may not accept the laws of karma but science itself does not explain everything so but either way we can talk about the laws of karma also uh, there are also laws and that law essentially is that whenever there is action there will be a reaction there is a newton there is a law of motion also just similar but that does not involve consciousness that does not involve personal agency but the principle is that by god's will the laws of karma occur and by god's will those laws can be suspended also so just as the lord you could say he made a different mechanism by which the earth floated even if by normal gravity it shouldn't be floating but the earth was floating so the purpose was to get the earth to float similarly the law of karma also has a purpose the purpose is not just to punish people you did this so you are going to get this you did this so you are going to get that the purpose is not punitive but reformative it is not to punish people but to transform people and that is why when somebody takes up the practice of bhakti somebody surrenders to the lord at that time what does he do sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayishyami ma shuchaha mokshayishyami he says that whatever pap whatever wrong doings he may have done i will protect you from those reactions so this is there is justice and there is mercy so justice is law bound you could say justice is somewhat mechanical you did this wrong you will get this consequence you did this wrong you will get this consequence so justice is mechanical mercy is personal where the lord sees that somebody is sincerely trying to reform themselves that person is trying to come to me is trying to live a better life then what happens in that person's life is not necessarily only according to the laws of karma now again this doesn't mean that the laws of karma don't act the laws of karma also act in a devotee's life but it is not just the laws of karma acting it is krishna overseeing personally and making sure that whatever happens is best for that devotee's spiritual evolution for the growth of that devotee's consciousness toward krishna and how does krishna do this krishna does it by acting not just externally but also internally externally means externally events will happen in our life even for a devotee things will go wrong sometimes that's the nature of the world sometimes people may let us down sometimes we ourselves might make some embarrassing mistakes sometimes you know if nature is cold it the world is also feel cold we are not exceptions to that so at the level of nature things will happen in many ways similarly to how they happen similarly to how they happen to a non devotee but the lord of course the lord can orchestrate things externally also and that is wonderful when he does it but more importantly 
the Lord acts internally. Internally to guide the devotee. How is this favorable for my devotional service? How can, what is this meant for? How can this take me toward Krishna? So for example, Shri Prabhupada was diligently trying to assist his spiritual master's mission by running a very running a big business and he wanted to offer the proceeds from that business to his Guru Maharaj. But it was just not working. He tried once, tried twice, tried in one city, tried in another city, then tried in third city. He tried first in Kolkata, then he was in Mumbai for some time, then he went to Prayag, Allahabad. He's trying so many, nothing was working. And finally, because of various issues, including betrayal by a servant, the business collapsed. And now that was a disaster. But Krishna from within the heart, Krishna through the association of a devotee, told Prabhupada that Yasya Manugranami Harisheta Dhanam Janai Tatodhanam Dijatyasya Swajana Dukkha Dukkhitaha That to those whom I give special mercy, I take everything away from them. So that they have nothing except me to turn to. Now we may say, what is this on mercy? Now God should be giving things to us. Yes, to give resources to us is God's mercy. But to give resources to us is God's mercy. But to give himself to us is his greatest mercy. And sometimes the resources can take us to Krishna. Say, if we have financial stability, if we have good health, if we have good relationships, then all that stability can help us go toward Krishna. But sometimes when that is taken away, then we have nothing except Krishna left. So Krishna's mercy can come in different ways. And essentially a devotee has to become expert at the art of translating life events in a way that they are favorable to our bhakti. So, we need to translate life events so that they are favorable to our bhakti. Okay, this has happened. To my vision, this is a terrible, terrible happening. Why did this have to happen? But then, I use my intelligence. I consult devotees. I pray to Krishna. And then we get that wisdom. Okay, why is this happening? This is how it is favorable for my bhakti. This is how I can move toward Krishna. This is how it is for ultimately for my good. So in tomorrow's class, I'll talk more about this principle of translating life events so that they are favorable to our devotion to some extent. And uh, the afternoon seminar also on overcoming discouragement. I'll be talking about a similar theme. But this particular theme, I'll be continuing in tomorrow's class. I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on the theme of how Krishna keeps us afloat in material existence. The background is that the earth which had sunk into the ocean is lifted by Varaha Dev and is kept in the, uh, on the ocean so that it stays afloat. And I talked about three points in the class that the laws of nature which are told by science, discovered by science themselves require an explanation. That when science comes up with mechanisms, those mechanisms it's, it's intelligence to discover that. But where do those mechanisms come from themselves? So either, uh, either scientists can say the mechanisms exist in nature itself, na matter and the laws are eternal, or they've come by chance. But these are so complicated that they could not have come by chance. Even scientists acknowledge that. And they say there are many different universes and like a dice being thrown. In this universe, the laws have come out to be like this. Now among these three explanations, Science itself has now shown that the universe is not eternal. So the laws of nature had to have come from somewhere. Then what about parallel universes? Well, there is no evidence for that. So it's more science fiction than science. And then what is the explanation left? That God. That it is from some higher organizing principle that the laws of nature have come about. 
So even Newton, when he proposed the law of gravity, what he gave was a mathematical formulation for an observed phenomena. He did not actually tell about the causal mechanism by which things happen, the, the, how, the origination of how it comes about. So we discussed that science can name phenomena, but naming is only a part of the explanation. It's like if somebody can't walk, you can say it's because of polio. But giving a name polio doesn't explain how polio came about or how polio came to that person. Similarly, saying that apples fall because of gravity or planets float because of gravity doesn't explain where that mechanism of gravity came from. So, and the second point I said is that God is the explanation for the operation of the natural laws and for the transcendence to the natural laws. So, we talked about how <clears throat> there can be for the same thing a mechanical explanation and a personal explanation and both can go together like in cooking a delicacy there can be the mechanical explanation the recipe and the personal explanation the cook and both go together so in this understanding God is not the explanation for the unexplainable it is not that because we can't explain things so we are attributed to God so God and religion are not in the tension but as science, in, sorry, God and science are not in attention that as science explanation increases, there is no need for God. No, as si God is the explanation for explainability. Why do the mechanical explanations work? That is because there is a personal organizing princip principle underlying in them. And that is why the more we study scientific advancement, the more our understanding of God's glory also increases. Now, with this understanding of the mechanical and personal explanations, just as a cook might be able to cook uh, a similar tasting item even when those ingredients are not there. The cook is not necessarily stuck to the process, to the recipe. The cook focuses on the purpose. Similarly, when the Lord wants, even without the natural laws of gravity, the mechanism, that particular mechanism, the Lord can get the product. The, what is getting the earth to float on the ocean? So, God, if, we, if we focus on only the mechanical explanation, then we can't explain miracles. But if we look at the personal explanation, then we can explain the normal functioning and we can explain miracles also. Miracles are not against science, they are above science. And then lastly, I talked about how this principle can apply in our lives, that there is the principle of karma, which is like the mechanical explanation. Well, we do something, we get something in return. But along with that, there is a personal explanation. The purpose of the Lord in instituting the laws of karma is not, not punitive, it is reformative. Not that He wants to punish us, but that He wants us to reform, to raise our consciousness, to come to Him. And if somebody is doing that, the Lord can withdraw or suspend or adjust the laws of karma. So when devotees go through distress, it's not that it is not karma, but it is something more than karma. It is the Lord is orchestrating the principles of material nature so that whatever happens is favorable for the devotee's spiritual evolution. And for us to understand that, how is this favorable? We need to have a prayerful service attitude. A devotee needs to become expert at translating life events so that instead of seeing them simply as distressful, we see them as opportunities to move closer to Krishna. When Prabhupada lost his business, he saw that Krishna is taking everything away so that he can give himself to me. So similarly, if we learn to translate life events so that they are favorable for the practice of our bhakti, for our spiritual growth, then we can stay afloat and cross over this ocean of material existence. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. So, 
what happens when we start doing the personal process of bhakti such as chanting mechanically because our existence you could say is multidimensional the body the mind and the soul so from the soul consciousness comes mm -hmm. but the body is more or less mechanical the mind is material but it's not exactly mechanical it's it's subtle but we could say it's somewhat mechanical that we have impressions they are like programs and they keep coming in the same way so because our existence is we could say three level presently body mind and soul and out of those two components body and mind are mechanical so that's why the default tendency is to go toward mechanical behavior so it's not it's not unexpected of course that doesn't because it is expected doesn't mean it is desirable but we don't have to be too hard with ourselves when we gravitate towards mechanical behavior because that's just the way we will become because the body up currently our existence as, as embodied beings will mean that we will do some things mechanically so what transforms a mechanical action into a personal action is the investment of consciousness the investment of consciousness just like say if your phone or your computer is not working and you call customer support of the company and you get a very sweet machine voice now it might be sweet but you know if you want this do this if you want this do this if you want this do this if that's all we keep hearing so we get irritated we want to hear a person over there so when there is no investment of consciousness that's what makes it mechanical personal is when there is investment of consciousness so if we don't invest our consciousness in the practice of bhakti then what happens is the krishna connection is not very strong it is not that it is not there at all it is still there but it is very minimal and when the krishna connection is minimal then when difficulties come in our life the krishna connection is not there to guide us the krishna connection is not there to illuminate us say for example if we are chanting mechanically if we are practicing bhakti mechanically and then some temptation comes in our life then or some trouble comes in our life now when the temptation comes we can look at it in two ways one is oh this is opportunity for me to enjoy nobody is watching let me enjoy or you can say oh this is opportunity for me to show my devotion to krishna krishna i can have this but i want you and i want you more therefore i choose not to turn towards this so now if we are remembering krishna if during the practice of our sadhana bhakti we have strived to establish a personal connection with krishna then matta smutir gyanam apohanam cha krishna in 15 15 says in the gita i will give you remembrance or knowledge of forgetfulness so when we have personally invested in connecting with krishna then krishna will give us remembrance hey this is a test you can you can grow in this situation by showing your devotion to me but if we have not made the personal connection then we will not remember that so when we need to remember krishna we won't remember him similarly when trouble comes oh life is so terrible maybe krishna doesn't care for me maybe krishna doesn't even exist that kind of thoughts may pop up within us and not only will they pop up they will stay on and they will drain our consciousness but for if we are devote if we are practicing bhakti personally then what will happen at that time the right thought will come see krishna has told in scripture that this world is a place of distress and now i am experiencing this distress krishna's words are true so the same thing can actually increase my faith in krishna's words krishna has also said that if you if you become absorbed in me you can transcend distress so let me see if that works out so one, one scriptural teachings can be broadly classified into two one aspect is that this world is a place of distress the second aspect is that by taking shelter of krishna we can go beyond distress so when we experience distress we can think oh see the first aspect i have experienced it now i can see this world is a place of distress 
Now let me try to explain the second aspect. By taking shelter of Krishna, can I tolerate and transcend distress? So the same distress can increase our faith in scripture and Krishna or the same distress can decrease our faith in uh, scripture and Krishna. So the mechanical practice of bhakti uh, impedes in the uh, personal reciprocation that we can have with Krishna. And the personal guidance that Krishna can give us, we block it. So, Tesham Satata Yuktana Bhajatam Priti Purkam Tadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yena Mam Payantite Krishna says Buddhi Yoga, I will give you intelligence. But when? When? Bhajatam Priti Purvakam When we are serving, practicing bhakti affectionately. If we are practicing bhakti uh, mechanically or worse still resentfully, then our consciousness becomes, say Krishna, we are here, Krishna is here. Now the pathway between us and Krishna has to be like a conductor. And our personal practice of bhakti makes that pathway like a conductor. But when we are mechanical or resentful, then that pathway becomes like an insulator. And Krishna's guidance cannot reach us. And that's why we will blunder through life. We will we'll face small problems and we will act in ways that make the small problems worse. But when problems come, if we have invested in personally connecting with Krishna, we will act in a way that can deal with the problems maturely. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe one question. Okay. So thank you very much. Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki, Itai Gaur Premanandi.